Today's episode is going to be a bit different. Honestly, I don't know how it's going to turn out. I have some notes, but we'll see where it goes. It is my 40th birthday today. I love my birthday and I love to celebrate it, but because it's 40, such a turning point for so many people, I want to take the time on this podcast to just talk about what it feels like to be 40, my thoughts turning 40, and whether or not you are even close to 40, it doesn't matter, or you're, you're way past 40, it doesn't matter at all. Basically, I want to share some words of wisdom that I would have um, wished my younger self would have known. Things that have really helped me out in life. And also just give, offer some comments about how society perceives aging and how I have changed my perspective on it. So I've got some notes here written down. This might be a really short podcast. It might be a really long podcast because I talk forever. I don't know. We'll see. But it will be interesting for sure. So um, let's just get right into it. Okay, let's get started. First, I want to start off with just talking about the age 40. When I was growing up, I remember my parents would get cards from their friends or from relatives, and I don't remember if it was the 40th birthday or not, but just the whole joke of being over the hill, and if you go into the card section, you'll see lots of jokes about getting older, but I don't think that way anymore, and so many people dread turning older. They deny their age. They just fear it so much. They fear the aging, um, I think the physical aging, and there's there's lots of sides to the physical aging. It's not just our appearance, but you, your body does feel different. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But, um, and then of course, uh, not to be morbid, but you're, you're getting closer to the end, which people fear. I am really happy to be turning 40. And I genuinely mean that. Do I want to always look young? Yes, of course. I, I am not immune to that. But with 40, there are so many benefits. I just feel like such a more confident, strong, both physically and mentally and emotionally individual, and so just much more sure of myself, which comes from knowing myself. I don't feel like I knew myself that well in my 20s, and even in my 30s. So I welcome 40. I don't think it's over the hill at all. In fact, I don't even think of my life as a hill. I think of it, honestly, as always this upward trajectory. And even when I get much older, my 70s, 80s, 90s, I really think I'll have the same perspective, and I'll talk a little bit about how I got to um, to get to that perspective, how I was able to um, develop that perspective, because I certainly wasn't raised with that perspective. I love my parents very much, but they were very realistic. Um, they are the what they would consider to be realistic. And they felt like they saw life as what it really was. But I felt that they, knowing what I know now, and also our society tends to focus on what's wrong in life. What do we not want? That's really what we focus on. And it makes sense because evolutionarily speaking, you had to focus on what was wrong to survive. You had to focus on having enough food. You had to focus on predators in the environment. But now, 
I mean, food is a is um, you know it's definitely a huge concern for a lot of people out there. But for a lot of people listening to this podcast, there probably is an abundance of food, and your problem might even be that there's too much food around. That's really common in the United States. People are are overweight and trying to lose weight, trying to be healthier. So when we have these these needs met, then we try to find these problems of what's what's wrong. So we're focusing on what's wrong. And I remember just at the dinner table, like I love my parents, they're, they're amazing. But when we would talk about our problems or just talk in general, my dad especially would just bring up these major news stories about sadness that was going on in the world about people who had problems. And I mean, this is this is important to do. It's important to to know what's going on, and this also helps develop your gratitude in life. But talking about these, you know, huge floodings, natural disasters, people um, being uprooted from their homes for multiple reasons, wars, um, all these issues. It makes you really grateful for what's going on in your life. But if you focus on that too much, it does bring you down. So where I was going with this, I kind of got on a tangent, is that I'm happy I'm turning 40 because it means I've been here for this long. There's lots of people who don't make it to 40. Lots and lots and lots. Just recently, actually, my friend from graduate school, I used to go out with him uh, for drinks Probably almost every Friday, our, our group would go to um, this bar, this yeah, bar food place called McNally's. We would go there, I'd say around like six or seven o'clock, happy hour on a Friday. And he was one of the people who was always there. And um, I always like to stay out later. I was younger. This is another funny thing, talking about aging. When I was in my late 20s or mid mid to late 20s, early 30s, I was in graduate school and I would always say, oh, I'm gonna be going out forever. Even when I am older, I am, I'm never gonna be like one of those people who just stays home on Friday night. And I'm totally one of those people. <laughs> I mean, I do still go out like this on my birthday. I'm celebrating my birthday this weekend with friends and we're definitely going to go out and have drinks and probably go dancing and stuff, but I don't do it every weekend for sure. Actually, this weekend, I did a lot of cleaning <laughs> around my house and I took care of myself and I watched Nine Perfect Strangers and that was a wonderful weekend. Like I really had a great time. But going back to my friend from graduate school, I found out recently that he had a, a fall at his, at his home and he went to a coma and over the past few days, he passed away. So I'm not gonna complain about making it to 40 because every day that we're here is really a gift. And I know that sounds so cheesy, I know that it is so, it's said so frequently, but when you think about it, your life can be, can, can go away in just an instant. I now know of at least three people from high school who've passed away. Um, one of them actually passed away on our graduation day. We didn't know it at the time, but, um, he was racing cars and got into a bad accident and passed away, didn't even complete graduation. So 40 is really something to celebrate and I really mean that. I'm really so happy that I have every day here and when I'm feeling down, when I'm feeling upset, I, I really try to remember that. The other thing is that People, when people talk about 40, like I mentioned the over the hill thing, it's kind of like your life is ending. Or maybe there's not a lot of opportunity to grow. Or maybe, maybe your life is just as it is. Like this is your life and you just gotta accept it now. This is your family, this is your home, this is where you live, this is where what your career is. And that's also not true. That's not true at all. And if your life changes in a dramatic way, 
it can be so exciting. Yes, it's scary. My life is changing in a dramatic way right now. And it is scary, but it's also so exciting at the same time. So my life is changing um, in a couple of ways. The first way is I did a major career change. I trained ever since I graduated from college the year before I determined I wanted to be a wildlife biologist and that was my life goal. I wanted to do research. But if you've watched my videos, you probably heard me talk about this before, listen to my podcast. Slowly over time, I, I was always driven by conservation and slowly over time I realized that for lots of issues, we can do all of the research in the world, and research is super duper important. But if people don't believe in the research, if they can't interpret the research, if they don't trust the sources that the research is coming from, if it conflicts with their values, it doesn't matter how much data you have, you can't change minds. And I really wanted to not necessarily change minds, but I really wanted to get at the root of conservation problems, which which involves people thinking differently. So for example, with the forest elephants I studied in my PhD, the main reason that they're in decline is because of poaching, by far. They're being poached to death. And it's for a purely ornamental reason. They are being poached for their ivory, which is used to make jewelry, statues, that's it. They, the poachers leave the carcasses, they're not using the meat, and forest elephants are critically endangered because of this. Now yes, there's absolutely some other threats out there that affect forest elephants, but if there was no demand for ivory, for these trinkets, if the governments were corrupt, then forest elephants would be way better off, more or less fine, because we do have lots of habitat for them, at least in Central Africa, not in West Africa. So I really wanted to get at this root of like, of like, what makes people care? What makes people want to um, care about wildlife and support environmental initiatives and, and, um, donate to conservation and vote in ways that helps conservation projects. So I started to realize the importance of understanding people, um, education, and communication. And with my postdoc and applying for jobs and not securing a job in the Raleigh area, at the same time I was blogging, I loved it, I realized you could make a career out of it, so I did a big career change. And it was scary, it really was scary, because for the longest time, I had identified myself as a scientist. And I, I do still believe I'm a scientist, but I'm not leading research projects like I was. I'm not as in the science world as I was. Yes, I still have papers to finish, um, I, I still have quite a few to finish, honestly. I'm still a part of a camera trapping project that will generate more data. I'm still in touch with colleagues, so I still have the opportunity to keep publishing. But I'm not going to be doing research the way that I was doing it. And I'm not in that world anymore. And for a while, that, tra that transition felt like a failure. Honestly, sometimes I still feel that way, even though I'm not. But the research community, they kind of rear you, at least in graduate school, to feel that way, that like research is king, and if you're not doing research, then whatever else you're doing is just, it's kind of secondary, it's not as important. So I have this major career change. And it's also scary because I'm on my own. I am making my own money, which is a struggle at times. It's, it's not guaranteed. And actually I grew up in a family of, um, my dad was a business owner. So it's so funny because I watched him with his business and I just never thought I wanted to be a business owner, 
but I saw so many parallels between being a scientist and a business owner because even with science, I struggled. I didn't have a job. I applied for all these jobs. I got all these interviews and I was so close so many times and it wasn't because I did anything wrong. It wasn't because I didn't have the right experience. It's just because there was somebody who was a more perfect fit than me. They just either had a little bit more experience or something else that I didn't have, like a language skill that's happened to me before too. So what I'm trying to say here, what was I trying to say? <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Um, Okay, so I was moving in to science communication and at, this, at the same time, um, I wasn't getting a job. Oh, I remember what I was saying. So I was talking about being a business owner and that science is a lot like being a business owner. So at that time, I was trying to find a job and I was also trying to still fund my position at the museum because I loved it. So I was applying for grants to get money to pay for my salary. So again, it's like, it's kind of like running your own business. Like you got to find the money to support yourself. So it's really not that different than, than myself running a business now, but I started my own business and it was scary. And what I'm doing is still scary to me, but it's also so exciting and it's what I love to do. And there is just so much possibility in it. And that excites me so much. So if you are feeling really called to do something and if something feels really right for you, talking about grants, actually this relates to something that my, my last boss said about grants, is that if you're, so with grants they, they, they tell you certain things that the grant is looking for and if your research matches it, you should apply. And sometimes you have to fit your research in a context maybe that isn't what it was originally designed for, but that would fulfill the grant. So for example, for the forest elephant research I was doing, I you know, really could say like, I just wanna study forest elephants because I was interested in their natural history, I was interested in their social structure, which was true. But to get a National Science Foundation grant, I would have to talk about how they're an excellent model species to test the effects of um, habitat and genetics on social structure, comparing them to savanna elephants, blah, blah, blah. So my advisor was telling me that if you have to force yourself too much into a grant and like it's just too much forcing, it doesn't feel like it's a good fit, then you shouldn't apply for it. It's not a good fit. And that's kind of how I felt when I went to science communication full time and decided to start my business. Before with research, I definitely felt like I belonged. I definitely liked it, but it also felt like there were parts that were off. And the longer that I was in it, it felt like I was trying to force myself more into it. But when I talked on stage about research, when I wrote blog posts, when I do these videos, I just feel so different. It just feels, it just, it feels like this is my calling. So what I wish I would have told myself or what I'm telling you all in my wise 40 years today is to listen to that, to listen to that intuition, to listen to that pulling. And if you've got to do a career change, that's okay. Um, one of the most shared podcasts I I, um, I give to students or my followers is the one on Jeffrey Hunter. And he started his career in wildlife when he was 40. He worked at Verizon for 20 years and for those 20 years he was volunteering doing all these citizen science projects. And he was lucky enough to be able to work for a company that supported him to get a degree, degree in environmental studies. So while he was working at Verizon, he did that and he switched careers and he got the second job that he applied for. So it's never too late. If you want to do that career change, do it. I have so many people contact me, um, not even close to their 40s and they're in their mid 20s or late 20s and they think that it's too late and it's not. I love the book Everything is Figure Outable by Marie Forleo and the whole premise of that book is if you really want to do something you can figure it out you can make it work and I truly believe that. So the point I really want to emphasize is that 
I'm figuring myself out more over time and the decisions I'm making just feel better and better and that life keeps getting better. People think that life starts declining at 40. No, definitely not. So I mentioned the career change is a struggle and one of the struggles was not only shifting my identity as moving from this like strict researcher role to a science communicator role and and business owner too. It's weird to say I'm a business owner. Scientists are like like I don't know, they're just like weirded out by it. Like entrepreneur, business owner, they don't know how to take it. And there's not many of us, there's a, there's a handful of us in this field, so there's not many models. So it's scary just from lots of different um, aspects, but it's also exciting that there's not a lot of people out of there. There's a lot of opportunity and a lot of people that I can help. The other thing that's scary for me is I am going to be on my own. I recently separated from uh, my husband and my science communication business was was scary, yes, but not nearly that scary because my husband has a really secure and lucrative job and he actually switched his jobs a couple of years ago. And at the same time I was losing my job at the museum, I was a postdoc, it was a temporary job, his salary increased by how much my job was, that the salary I got paid. So there wasn't this pressure that I had to work anymore. And of course I did want to work. I've worked so hard on my blog, on my research, even after the museum, I'm still working on my research. I work um, really hard, I, I wrote a book, I work, I work really hard on these YouTube videos and podcasts and um, and also my my students too. I have courses, I have programs, I work really hard on all of that stuff. But there wasn't this pressure that I had to make money. Now there is that pressure. It was a very hard decision for me to leave and it was scary. It was really scary. It, and mostly it was scary because I had to be purely on my own and I, I come from a background where financial risk is not um, favored upon that um, my dad always supported me in my career but he grew up very poor and always wanted me to have a really financially sound and secure career and now and right now it's not so that's also scary but I love what I'm doing so much and I have so much confidence in what I'm doing that I know it will work out with 40 and being divorced, soon to be divorced, that's also a stigma that people think that, like they feel sorry for you. They're like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And it does, it does make sense because it is the end of something. But I am so excited for me. And I had friends who were single for years and they told me, don't, don't leave, don't leave her, or they would just, like, we would just be talking in groups and they would talk about, like, don't leave your partner unless it's, you know, really, really bad because it's so bad out there. There's no guys out there. And I am just, again, taking a different attitude. And I've started going on the dating apps and honestly, I am having so much fun. And it's not true that there's nobody out there. There's an abundance of people out there. And I know I am going to meet someone and I am so happy that I separated. My, again, my life just keeps getting better and better and better. So just because you're getting older doesn't mean that things are getting worse or just because you're making big changes in your life doesn't mean that things are getting worse, even though they might be scary. So the thing that I really want to share, how did I get these perspectives? Well, so many of it came from my entrepreneur podcast, honestly. As I started taking blogging seriously, I started listening to blogging podcasts, and I came into this world of entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship is scary, and you have to build yourself up every day. You get so many rejections. You're really putting yourself out there. I get so many comments on my YouTube videos. Some of them are really um, mean, <laughs> but so yeah, you have to keep building yourself over and over um, up again. 
So I think that the biggest thing that I've learned, sorry, I keep getting hair in my lip gloss. <laughs> if you're watching the YouTube, you can see me touching my hair. So I think the thing that I, that I get from these podcasts the most or that I've learned is I eventually went on this trajectory to a neuroscience podcast. And what I learned is that you control your thoughts and that your thoughts lead to your emotions and not the other way around. It definitely happens where you get emotional and things just happen and they don't make logical sense. But for the most part, if you pay attention to your thoughts, recognize what they are, start deconstructing them, understanding what's going on beneath them, deal with those emotions and start replacing them with new thoughts, you can change your emotions, which changes your body's chemistry. Um, your physiology and it makes you happier and that's what I've done. I don't partake in this negativity around aging. Even even the the stuff that is somewhat inevitable like like the body aging. Um, yes like I don't want my skin to sag and stuff like that but it's I don't know, it's not as bad as I is I thought it would be. Like yeah I do have a forehead wrinkle <laughs> that upsets me. But also, I mean, there's, there's, it doesn't have to be bad too, that I'm actually in the best shape of my life, pretty much. Even, even over high school, I have a thyroid issue. I have an autoimmune disorder. So in high school, I wasn't diagnosed yet. And I, even though I did sports and stuff, I always felt slow. I always felt lethargic. And now my thyroid is so much better treated. I have a personal trainer and my personal trainer has helped me so much with my body. Several years ago, or I guess, I mean a pretty long time ago now actually, I slipped my discs and my back has never been the same. Working with a personal trainer has helped me so, so much. I'm honestly in the best shape of my life and not just for vanity reasons, but really I feel so strong, I feel so capable and I, my body just feels so amazing. So you don't have to buy into this, you know, I hate getting older and things are just getting worse. That's not necessarily true. So change your thoughts. That's one of the big lessons that I wish I would have learned. That's the major one. The other one is to not let what people think about you affect you. This one's hard, but with changing my thoughts, listening to the entrepreneurial podcasts, this, I've been able to do it. I mean, honestly, pretty much for the most part. Check out my Black Panther video on YouTube. There's so many comments. Some of them mean, I, this girl doesn't know what she's talking about, blah, blah, blah. And I just, I, you get to a point, I used to defend myself, which, Honestly, I didn't do it as much for myself, but more to try to engage with the people, try to um, understand where they're coming from and talk to them about the what the research shows and things like that. But, um, shoot, I don't, I'm losing my train of thought again today. Um, so, but I used to engage with people and now I don't anymore. You have to just let them go. You just have, to, there's too many. I just, I can't waste my time doing that. There's just way too many. So, I've been able to disconnect my self-worth, my value, how I feel about myself from what people think about me. Same thing with social media. I've really been able to disassociate that. And one of the things that has really helped me, well, actually there's two. I would say the first thing is working on comparing yourself by, by not comparing yourself. And I now, instead of comparing myself, I celebrate people. I'm happy for people that are doing well. I used to not like it when I would see other people's social media followings grow in followers, but mine wouldn't. But now I'm happy for those people. And I look at it as a sign that that's coming for me too. So I've totally separated myself from other accounts and have given this happiness because they're their success has no uh, no effect on on my success. It's not like there's this this big pie and there's only x number of followers and if they take 10,000 followers there's fewer followers and for me that's not true at all. Multiple people can like multiple accounts and 
there's an abundance of people out there again. So this abundance issue is coming up again. The other thing is accepting not everyone is going to like you. It's impossible. You can't do it. It's 100% impossible. If you think of people who are really, really well liked, like, um, I don't know, Oprah comes to mind. There's tons of people who hate Oprah, who say really nasty things about Oprah. Um, I don't know who else, but, but I learned this from one of my entrepreneurial podcasts. It's kind of like a neuroscience entrepreneurial podcast, but he said, how many people have to like you for it to be enough? And just think about that. If you like had, I don't know, a song out there and you had, you know, two million people love the song or buy the song and then you had, you know, five critics write a review of it and say it was bad. We would focus on those five critics. That's what we do. So we would let those five critics, a huge minority, take away from all of the people who love what we're doing. So basically, it doesn't matter what people are saying about you and you're not gonna be pleasing everyone, so why even try? Why not just do what makes you happy and what makes you feel true to yourself, what feels good to your authentic self? And that's not to say that you don't wanna to listen to criticism or feedback, I totally do that. I read the comments, I, I listen to what others have to say, but don't let that affect your self-worth and don't let you feel like you need to please everyone in order to feel good. Okay, I think that's everything I wanted to say and um, I just wanna also say Thank you guys so much for listening to this podcast, for following me on social media. If you bought my book, thank you so, so much. I am just really so grateful for all of you, and I know that sounds really trite, but it's true. I get messages from you about how I've helped you, and I also just want to thank you for being so vulnerable to me as well. I've reached out to people asking them um, I've been reaching out to my followers, asking them questions to get to know them. And so many of you just open up to me so easily and so fast. And I just so appreciate that. When I did the research calls, you guys really shared so much with me. And I appreciate that so much. This field is, is not easy, honestly. Um, there's, there's some definite work that needs to be done. And there's not a lot of people in this field. And I think the, the, re the reason why I just wanna say it's not easy is because there's not a lot of people in this field who look at the whole human, who see us scientists as people and who nurture the whole human. That's what's so important. And I just wanna say that I do that, that I see you. I see you as more than a scientist. I see you as a person and that honestly, I genuinely care about you. I really mean that because there's just, I mean, it's important. There's just so little of that in this field and there's so many people suffering um, from mental health issues as a result of it. So you can always turn to me for positivity, for support. And once again, thank you guys so much.